John, thank you so much for for doing this, man. I mean, we've been getting to know each other for, gosh, it might be, it's not a year. I think it was probably, actually, I don't really know. It was somewhere. I feel in the, like it was May last year. Shit. Yeah. So it's not, it's not a year then. Or is it a year? It's no, been it over is. It's August now. Oh my God. <laughs> it's over a year. All right. It's over a year. We're old friends. Yeah. So. <laughs> um and yet we haven't met yeah i know there, i have actually a long list of people that i've collaborated with that i've only met virtually like this it's oh, i mean right. not because i enjoy that but that's just how sometimes the cookie crumbles you know so sure. we're far apart but i am looking forward to crossing paths in your neck of the woods or or here sometime soon but uh yeah likewise but thank you for doing this i really wanted to take it the opportunity to dive into this new work of yours because i have so many questions just as a listener as i dove into that space um music for psychedelic therapy this record is uh i feel like a bit different for you but also it's just by the nature of its title is sort of a unique offering and so there's something to unpack there and I just wanted to start with if you could tell us a bit about uh, this is this is an official John Hopkins record, like it's a release for you. But what about this is different aside on the face of it, you know, what it's called and what it's for? Or is it different for you like this, this work from what you've yeah, done before? It's very different. And I think the main way in which it's different is that this is something I've only become aware of retrospectively. But I think all the other albums and I'm not like doing them down for it but they are all they all had more of a they had um goals within the external world that i was trying to achieve like built into them and um, like let's take immunity for example which was the first one that got wider attention um like i wrote all of that you know with the same love and integrity that i try and apply to everything i write but there was this fact which was that it had to connect more because i'd done two solo albums and it hadn't really they hadn't really connected to people. So I'd done, I'd done a lot of collaborations and productions which had been more successful and I'd done film scores and stuff. So I was like, I had a living, but I always thought I, I wanted to give it like one more try, yeah, you know, to, to make a, a solo record as a composer and just, just see if I can make that part of, part of the picture. And of course, um, that one did that quite radically so that the other things took a back seat and that, you know, in a way it went to the other extreme and, um, Mm. But there was something built into that process of like, I have to make this one work. So I didn't leave anything to chance. I, you know, I did my absolute best on all fronts, even so far as like making sure the titles weren't shit because the previous albums had some <laughs> very, very empty titles because I'm not, uh, words are not my medium, you know. And for Immunity, I, I talked to a poet called Rick Holland and we had long conversations, which he turned into freeform poetry and I chose the names out of that and you know, right down to the artwork, which was like microscopic photography of crystals forming. Um, and you know, everything was just on a different level as much as I could make it. And then Singularity was like, okay, so I've got to this point, I have to go to this point. And again, it was all done with love and integrity, but it was, there was a, a huge amount of pressure, I suppose. And they both took you a long time, right? Yeah, that's a, that's a pattern. I mean, I think, um, I like to spend a long time on things, even if I'm not working the whole of that time. So like maybe the duration of the whole process is two years, but in that time I might be writing for a year. I mean, it's something like that, but um, with this one, yeah, anyway, just to, oh yeah, to finish what I was saying about singularity, there was like a desire, I think, even though I wasn't thinking about it I, consciously as I was writing it, there was a, an intention to make big tracks that I could play in front of a lot of people because you know, the, the show size in immunity had moved from the first show in London, which was 600 to the, to the one at the end, which was like 10,000. That, wow. that is, that's the change in, in numbers. So I was like, okay, so we're starting at this number. And then a uh, singularity ended with a show at Glastonbury to 35,000 people, um, which was what? on the BBC. Yeah, this is crazy. So <laughs> this was, and I guess on some level I was aiming for that whilst at the same time trying to still express myself truly. Um, but all you know we've talked a bit about this privately but like the the experience of touring those records was 
as in any musician who tours that much will tell you it's it, it kills the body you know it can be incredibly difficult to of course to play hundreds of shows all over the world with your sleep pattern all over the place and the pressure of having to be not just on form but like on peak form at, at random times of the night particularly in the dj set part of it um so then you know pandemic comes along and you know it's, it, i really don't want to like attach the narrative to this album that it's a lockdown album it's not this is something that had started we'll go back to the origins of it in a bit in a minute but you know this is something that was in existence but i didn't know it was going to become an album but suddenly had all these months and um i just i was having a lot of personal upheaval good things and bad things were happening and obviously the world was doing what the world was doing and everyone you know everyone was having their own kind of crises of different sizes and responses in different directions and um i just felt like this is the time to make a record with none of those intentions to have absolutely no no real <laughs> nothing no intention at all apart from honesty like genuinely just to try and do that and i thought i was doing that before and um it, it just turns out that I wasn't so much. So this is like the most unguarded, most honest, most is totally, you know, not interested in calls, not interested in reviews. It's not interested in live shows. This is just my, my absolute declaration of who I am and what I believe and what I want to hear in music without any of those fences or, or guards, I suppose. How much of that confidence to step into that vulnerable state, not just with your music, but with your career, came from revelations uh, from the inner space, whether the psychedelic journeys themselves or meditation. I'm all like, what, 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 yeah, like, tell me, was there a moment where you're yeah. like, I have to do this, you know, I'm just going to do yeah. it? Yeah. So the, the medicine that kind of seemed to, I think it's really difficult with me because I do a lot of different practices and it's quite hard to narrow down. I think quite often combinations of things are absolutely yeah. fascinating. And for me, it's a mixture of holistic practices like transcendental meditation, which is, which is my kind of foundation practice twice a day, every day for six years now. And then Kundalini yoga, which I've been doing for 20 years. And then the more extreme end of that Wim Hof method breathing, which you know, it takes me to this extraordinary energetic kind of peak. And then, and then there's the actual medicines and the ones that I've found over the years, um, in recent years, particularly to be most safe and valuable for me have been MDMA and ketamine in, in um, different quantities and, and used in different ways. But I think the particular epiphany that led to the titling of this record came from um I'd, I'd had a night with some friends the first in ages because you know lockdown in london was only just ending and i went sure. to uh, some, some of my best friends had a if i had me around for a little dinner party and we had a little mdma afterwards and um it was wonderful you know it was a lovely warm circle of, of loved ones and we had a good laugh and it wasn't you know it wasn't like huge amounts or anything but it was a sparkly and heartwarming thing and it was the first time in a long time that i'd done anything like that hadn't done anything like that really the year before um and when i got home it was like 4 a.m and i i was still awake i was still quite high i guess and i was just like i'm gonna have a little bit of ketamine and see <laughs> put some music on <laughs> and i i just on some sort of um following some strange intuition i put on um this album called emerald and this is by an artist called elf e-l-v-e -E. And I, if you have show notes for this or you want to, just, yeah. this album needs to be heard. It's the most extraordinary record. And I don't think my music would have taken this direction without hearing this record. I've been a fan of it and I've talked about it a lot in the last um, four years since I heard it first. Um, but I'm never going to stop talking about it. <laughs> so, um, uh, it's, it's like an immersive sound experience with a lot of field recording and a lot of um, very disintegrated um elements that somehow seem to form a whole it's very abstract it doesn't have traditional melodic elements at all um but it just i heard it that night in that particular space and i mean it just i've i've heard that record on on dmt and on various other 
things but for something about that night and maybe it's just the way everything aligned i just i just had a, a sort of epiphany really which was that that i would need to connect the various pieces of music i've been writing some of which were along these lines um into one body of work and it would be called music for psychedelic therapy because the power of that experience was so intense um so totally beyond words and you know sometimes i hear ketamine described as a neutral zone or a void and for me it's not it's yeah it's me neither absolutely bursting with life and energy and and self-love and compassion and and the people in my life make appearances you know as if they are consciously choosing to that's very common um it's highly sacred experience highly spiritual and um so i returned from that with the with the title of the record and then i, I think at the next weekend i had a similar experience with some different pieces of music in which i one of which was a track called Weeping Birch by Dan Deacon, which is a truly extraordinary piece of music as well. Um, and the difference about that occasion was that I started bringing in the breathing techniques of the Wim Hof breathing um, whilst in the ketamine space. And I mean, <laughs> I don't know if you ever tried anything like that. But a little bit I have. It yeah, really takes yeah. things to another level. I mean. Yeah, and as I've, I've done it with, with psilocybin and, and DMT and slow nose breathing is like my lifeline but actual Wim Hof method breathing during ketamine was just like what the fuck it was like <laughs> bursting through the ceiling of the universe and um I I reached that place you know I know you've been there where you get it you get everything you understand briefly just briefly you understand everything and you're fully fully 100% awake and tuned in and and it was a heart space thing it's like I'm 100% in here and 0% up here and um yeah that kind of laid the foundation for this thing starting to form into one body of work i would say those two events man i i've i've had similar experiences where you're you're listening you have an experience with music in those spaces and it's so powerful and salient on like that's really why i do kind of everything I, I do with music now and I, there are many times that I doubt it that I'm like I talk to musicians and friends and, and people on this show and otherwise and they're like a lot of musicians are like I have no agenda with my music you know like almost secular apolitical I'm, I'm but you know it's deeply personal for them but they're like I'm just making it you you interpret it as you like you do what you mm -hmm. want with it and I've often felt the opposite personally where I like I, I had these these, these feelings about what it could be or what I, sh if I could just have the courage to say, Hey, this is what I'm doing with it. This is what you could do with it too. And, and maybe even that way, it's a tool. Um, but how do you feel about that? If someone were to say, like, they'd ask you, like, do you have an agenda with this particular album or not? Yeah, that's a good question. I think um, it turns out I do. Um, I'm not sure I was thinking about it when I was writing it, but you know, like there's always the, the, the subconscious doing its thing, but um, the agenda is to, I suppose, do my little bit to, to advance the conversation about psychedelic therapy. There's many things I want to try and do with it, but that's one of them. And, you know, we've talked a little bit about this separately, but I think, um, you know, there's this huge amount of news and breakthroughs and science going on around the subject and almost no one mentioning the music and the music as anyone who's had a deep experience yeah. with the psychedelic medicine knows that the music is about half of it. <laughs> it's like the structure into or, which or you... more. Yeah, or I mean, more. really, it really yeah. is. It can be literally become the space. Yeah. yeah, and I find I find with ketamine in particular, and this album is the, the length of time that my particular ketamine journeys tend to take. Um, I find that, yeah, you, you merge with it to such a degree that you flow as it and you flow through it and with it. And so that leaves you in this incredible position when you're writing it of like knowing that you're building a universe on a screen, which you will then enter. So you're, you know, make it. And so of course you want to make it as incredible as possible. And, and you also need to test it by re-entering it, um, in that space sometimes. So I wanted to um, 
I suppose really yeah name the album in a way just you know this is what it is but it's also an album of music and it, it doesn't require medicines you can like it, it's definitely one for deep listening it's not something you I mean maybe people will have it on the background in fact it's not really for me to to say sure what, what the limitations are of what it can do but the way I hear it it's like it's quite an emotionally intense thing and um you know for me obviously um but I think, yeah, there's an important topic that needs to be discussed. So I, I suppose it's like a little uh, conversation opener in a way. Yes. And I, I couldn't agree more that it seems to be a bit of an afterthought afterthought in this burgeoning psychedelic wave that we're in mm. is the the experience itself. That I'll just call it the journey, the ceremony. And that well, that element that element of ceremony and what a large role music plays to guide it. And you know. That's how it's been done for millennia is music is the ceremony itself, whether it's the Akaros in the ayahuasca ceremonies that uh, they often define as what is actually calling forth the spirit mm. is the songs and the words mm. and the melodies of those songs. You look at a Shipibo, I have one in the house, a Shipibo uh, 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 embroidery tapestry. I have one as well, actually, yeah. Yeah, and I was told yeah. that the actual like geometry of the shapes is of the melodies. It's of the yeah. songs. So it's a score. There you go. Oh my god, yeah, <laughs> it's sheet music. So Yeah. Uh, and you and you see this in other ceremonies as well from Lakota sweat lodges and it's all about the songs uh, and how the lineage of those songs. So it is a very important element. I think there is this really interesting vanguard. Like what is what is this modern musical language for us for people who grew mm. up in the west who are entering into these modern spaces that are getting commercialized but also sometimes just people in their own homes and in that way did you do you think of yourself or did you ever when you were making this process with the recognition that you're like i hate to say this but i mean you're a facilitator but it's a form of like digital shamanism i mean it's a big role did you ever think like you're playing a very strong active hand in guiding people's journeys yeah, I, I think um, that's, I suppose, why I take it so, take the writing process so seriously. And now I would never call myself a digital shaman, but I just because I don't, I, I feel like I don't have any education about the indigenous ways of. Absolutely. The, the, work, the work I meant is serving yeah. the role of a facilitator once you sort of put it out in the world, you know? Yeah, I think, yeah. I think it's, I think when we talk about electronic music in particular and the ability of electronic music to have this particular synergy with, let's just keep talking about ketamine because this is the, you know, the, this was the thing, the guiding hand in this album so much. Um, it's really different. So I, yes, I, sometimes I listen to things that are acoustic and guitar based and her voices and they're all extraordinary, but there's something about immersive dimensional electronic music mm -hmm. that feels like a frontier. It's like there's something and it has to be because the that genre is reasonably new and ketamine itself being used as a as an entheogen in a way is is also new so it feels like we're kind of in this amazing position to explore something that potentially could be incredibly powerful it's yeah. quite hard to measure exactly what it's doing but i've come out of experiences with so much clarity so much perspective and so much wonder and um so yeah i think like in the in the creative process with this one i just took that incredibly seriously as if i was you know as if it, that was my role and then of course it's up to people whether they trust in in me to listen to it like that well i want to talk about the nuts and bolts of making this because i'm very interested in that but let's start more broadly with like how did it differ from how you make other records like I'm guessing that a lot of this comes, you have to open yourself up to that intuitive improvisational, like allow that larger thing to flow through as opposed to like mm. just your discursive mind deciding, okay, it's going to have to have this 20 minutes in, it's going to need some more rhythm or it needs to go into a minor or whatever. Mm. What was that process like that maybe was different with this piece versus? Well, it, it, it was really kind of um, by removing any grid and any rhythm of any kind so no tracks have any tempo um, nothing ever happens with regularity mm. um, everything's always fluid and um, I found that and that wasn't a conscious decision but yes yeah, so I suppose to, to respond to what you're saying the I 
I'm always open to that immediate flow of stuff, you know, that immediate improvisational beginning to a track. But if I'm making a something that's, that needs to be danceable or performable in a certain way, then at some point the rhythm comes into it. And for many people, they can compose the rhythm in that same kind of flow state. And for me, it's, it's very, very technical. It's very, very... Uh, it can be very exhausting making kick drum centered music. You know, I don't dislike any of the stuff that I've done in that world, but it's just, it's definitely not what I felt like doing. So the removal of that framework and the removal of any rhythmic framework allowed for this, what I think of as like a different kind of rhythm to come in, which was the rhythm of things as they landed, you know? So there's a lot of field recordings on there and rather than put them on the track and move them around and edit them, I just put them on, just let them, sit how they were supposed to sit and sit how they were recorded any idea that came drag it on almost at random and just listen to it with the knowledge that increased with every working day on this that it would be right straight away and this happened again and again and again there's so many synchronicities where things just landed right and it happened with the sounds that came up and so like a one one example right i i sometimes when i'm working later into the evening i'll drink beer at the same time it seems to unlock a couple of extra hours of energy and and take some of the work-like feel out of it so i like really nice beers and um, there was this one track that i was working on called uh, love flows over us in prismatic waves um the titles on this record are not really supposed to be spoken aloud i've just discovered <laughs> it's more like to be read as a as a <laughs> poem or something because really it's one whole track but anyway that was the the track i was working on and i had this beer and the you know the track is in f and for some reason i flicked the beer glass at this certain point and it was an a which is the third you know the, the, the beautiful missing piece of the chord i had because major I had like a, yeah yeah a major third so i had like a I had a fifth going and I had a G in there, which is kind of what you might call like a, a, a calming neutral chord. And this little flick was just the third, which completed the picture, but in a very subtle way. So I didn't want to like hammer the third in there. But you know, the third is the thing that sweetens everything and you, you need to use it sparingly. So um, rather than think about this for a second, I'd learned by this point, just put a mic on it immediately and record one pass and that'll be that. And it was obviously straight away exactly right and then i tuned it down for when the chord changes um i didn't drink more beer to tune it i just <laughs> used, used used ableton but that kind of thing happened um really th throughout every track in different ways and i started to have such faith that i remember reading this rick rubin quote i won't get it exactly right but it was something like when something when, when seemingly random components join together to make something or, or when they seem to make sense, something wants to exist. Yes. Uh, that, oh, that's that, so good. Yeah. There's so many great Reuben quotes out there. It's, um, it's our mutual friend, Corey Allen, posts them occasionally. And that's how, that's how I saw that one. <laughs> um, but yeah, something wants to exist. And I, I lived by that motto for the creation of this album. It's like this thing has. So, so in a way, it, it became me serving the existence of this thing. And um it was difficult not to get like a strange sensation that something, yeah, just, well, I didn't even try. I just went with that sensation and thought, well, I'll deal if this is delusional, I'll deal with it later. But right now it feels like I'm a channel for something and I'm lucky to be that channel, but it isn't anything that I did. It's just the way I'm built and the time and all the things I've done in my life. But really like something is opened and this is like flooding through in a way that it's only ever i've only ever had like trickles before do you think that'll inform your writing process and creation process in the future it kind of depends what happens next i mean i love the idea of doing a volume two of this um but i want to see how it feels to make something this personal uh, a public thing um and also you can't perform this live so you know there is that and there's a desire to occasionally perform which this wouldn't really allow so um why do you I think, think you can't i mean I, under, I definitely understand the challenges but i've seen i've only seen videos of you perform you get quite creative in your ways that you perform electronic music and i could see creative ways of doing this um 
it, you'd have to reinvent it in a sense. I mean, it would be maybe, maybe it's maybe it'd be better to say I have no plans to perform it, but not. OK, it's fair enough. But right. I, right now, how I feel about it is that it's impossible because it um, is it's exactly what it's supposed to be. And I'm not saying that's a good thing or a bad thing. All I'm saying is that the intention, like the the purity of it, is exactly what what I what I set out to do. And therefore, any changes, any other versions, any and a performance would obviously have to sound different from it. Otherwise, what's the point? Um, would be not it anymore. You know. What about this though? I mean, what if the record exists as it as a tool, as an experience, as an album? But then I, man, people would be so excited to say, I want to drop into that kind of space with John Hopkins live where you're just doing something different. But it's what the, the glue that holds it together is what you're speaking about is your intention, the openness of you creating in the moment, which you've done before anyway, but it's sort of the lens you put on it. And it would be a completely different piece. You know, we just set you up with a series of instruments, some synths, and you just, yeah. make, you just make sound for two hours and people lie down. Yeah, that's more appealing. Yeah, if we take it away from trying to trying to do that thing, um, you know, trying to make a yeah. But it, it could well be that I, I mean, I'm so unbelievably close to this. Uh, it's starting to shift finally. You know, I finished. I think we mastered in May. Um, we're now in. Well, we're, now we're talking. It's August. So um, for a while, I couldn't even talk about certain sections of it without becoming emotional because. You know, I, the the heavier tracks in it, the heavy, the ones which carry more emotional weight, uh, were written were a, a great processing of of loss and and various things that were going on in my life and in the greater society in the world. So, you know, it was so it's so raw and open. And as we as I start to talk about it, you know, this is only um, it's right at the beginning of the process of even learning how to talk about it. I feel like that will become a little it will kind of heal over and it'll be a little easier for me to detach and talk about it and then maybe a stage after that will be okay maybe i start reorganizing it into something that could be performed but you know one of the things i always find hardest about the traditional album cycle is like you finish something you put everything into something and you master it and then it seems like you get about five days off and then you have to start working out to play the fucking thing in front of people <laughs> like and that's the point at which your songs start to piss you off and oh, yeah. that's not what i want with this it's like because this car as it stands this record is my actual soul entirely unvarnished right so i don't want to get bored of it i don't even listen to it right now and the next time i listen to it will probably be another month um but and i don't i just you know i need to feel i, I want to preserve that for as long as i can before eventually having heard it too many times <laughs> Well, I appreciate you uh, speaking about it now, and I recognize I can feel the vulnerability in it. And I, I, I can tell you uh, as an outsider, that's what we love about it. You know, and that's what we love about this offering. And that's something we're really hungry for as a people. It's like that sort of exposure to the intimacy of like one human's experience as, as close as we can get to the center. And, and that's very present in there. And that's, that's needed. It's really needed uh, now more than ever because authenticity and that genuineness mm -hmm. is, is it's like the gold, you know, it's the golden nectar of our time. So, you know, thank well, you just, for doing that. Yeah, no, I appreciate you saying that. And I think, um, yeah, it, it was like, it, <laughs> I had this thought at some point when it became clear what this was forming into. It, it feels like the time for all the bullshit is, is done, you know, there's, yeah. there's no more excuses <laughs> just like honesty yeah, true honesty and vulnerability is really the only answer all hands on deck and exactly. what's needed is honesty <laughs> it's like yeah. truth it's the old tell yeah. the truth uh yeah. yeah it's it's really incredible man i mean i i could really man yeah i could totally see it just becoming a live experience that is um that sort of honesty and truth in the live space i mean i recently one of my heroes is Keith Jarrett, who, mm. uh, you know, which is famous for sitting down at a piano and just going for it and seeing what happens and comes out. And uh, I, I'm, I don't have the even close to the virtuosity of his technique, but that spirit of it is something that's been really inspiring to me. 
and when I play in a quote unquote ceremony space, like actually guiding people on medicine, which is how I started this whole thing right. 12 years ago, it's a hundred percent improvised because it just doesn't work. If I walk in there with a plan where right. I think I'm performing, it's gotta be just all from the heart. And it's just, I don't know, it's going to take its time. And I feel safe in that environment because people of the medicine, they're patient. They're just in it. We're all just there for a long period of time in the dark. So it feels okay. And that is what my early records actually were. And it it felt incredibly vulnerable to share that because I thought like the world's going to judge this. They're going to be bored, all this stuff, but it ended up being fine. Mm -hmm. And it just helped me to slowly lean into it. And I can feel even all these years later, I still would love to step into the public space, like full, just normal, quote unquote, performance ticket holders that theoretically are sober and do that. And, but I still, you know, have my own fears about being judged or it's like Mm. people want this or that, or to be entertained as if that's not entertaining on some level. But when I say it to you, I know that's what I'd love to see. I mean, I'd love to see you do your fully rehearsed thing too, for sure. But I'm like, wow, I would be watching a moment in time where we're just there together and anything could happen or not happen. Well, it's interesting because um, completely different tour but like the the tour that i was on when the pandemic first hit which was called polarity which involved um like me on a grand piano opening the show and then Mm. other players joining so there was a guitarist leo abrahams and violinist emma smith and and um so like we would there were sections in the show and they increased. We got, I think we got seven shows in out of the 18 before we had to cancel or before all the venues were shut, um, which was an insane experience um, to live through. But um, the show was really getting freer and freer. And I realized that, I mean, I grew up improvising. Improvising on piano was my first thing. That's what I learned. That's what I taught myself before I had any piano lessons. And I was- Jazz or just- No, it was never really really jazz. It was, um, it's quite hard to describe it. I mean, you wouldn't be surprised if you were to hear it. Like, it sounds like me. It's just, it, it just got a bit more dissonant and a bit more daring in the chord structures because, you know, my albums, the recent albums, well, no, all the, all the released albums, you know, the, the, there's no kind of, there's some unusual chord sequences, but the chords themselves are not like, they're not, they haven't got like crazy clusters of notes. So they're not particularly complex. But I started to find that when I was at school, I did a bit of jazz improvising, but I started to find in this tour that I was getting more and more open to unusual harmonies and more and more daring. And by the end of it, I was doing, I think about 15, 20 minutes where I would, at the beginning of the show, where I just walk on with no idea what my first note was going to be. And How'd that I, I, feel? It was incredible. Is it was off? liberating because that's where I started. And I, I, I'd yeah. kind of hidden that because I thought it'd be scary, but in a way it's less scary because um, I did the same thing at Sydney Opera House. In fact, that was the first time I did it. It was like, this is a test. I had this, this show in Sydney and it's like, I'm going to do 20 minutes on the piano to start. And then I'm going to walk over to the electronic stuff and just do what was currently my rehearsed set, which was all really upbeat. So it was like two shows in a way. That's cool. But it felt amazing. And um, so I thought, okay, I'll build the London, I'll build the uh, UK Europe tour around this um, and be more confident with it and have lots of sections like that. And it just became, yeah, because the thing that makes me most nervous is the technology crapping out because- me, uh, Oh my God, me too. That's what happened. I don't even that. want to talk about it because I, I know scared it's talking awful. about it. It's a horrible feeling. And, you know, the show I mentioned at Glastonbury um, to all those people there was no proper backup system because we were on tour and we couldn't like bring double of everything I know it was just it, it really should have done to be honest but because the show is is quite free form you can't just have a, a tape running in the background I don't you know there, it, basically it is my responsibility to sort that out but generally it's it's if you're carrying you know there's only a certain amount of stuff that a small crew can carry around yeah I can't I'm not gonna make excuses about it because obviously you know, in, in 200 shows, I probably had five or six where it's just gone silent at some point. And, and crowds are actually very cool with it most of the time, as long as you can get it going again. But that is my fear. It's not because I know how to do the rest. I know how to play the music and I know how to... But sitting at the piano, nothing can go wrong. You can just you just play. And that's what I've been doing for 30, 
six years or something, 38 years. Yeah, I, I have some friends who tour and they have, they literally have like two systems off stage and you hit a button that just goes to the other one kind of thing. Yeah. And I saw I a band. Yeah, yeah I, I wish I had that. Um, I just don't have the space for all that kind of gear right now. That's it. It's the same. That's the same with our crew. We had like seven or eight people and a lot of lights, a lot of other stuff. And, mm. uh, and you know, and the setup. To, to duplicate everything and, and also to work it into the things I have on stage. I mean, yeah, you could have a laptop. Yeah. How do you have your hardware controllers duplicating and your chaos pads, which I use, which that's audio only. So you, you, it, I couldn't do it, that. Yeah. I mean, it was too complicated. And only way you could really do that is I have like literally a whole separate setup off stage. It's like on a platform yeah. that wheels, it would be ridiculous. <laughs> it's yeah. like, I think I'd probably, yeah. Anyway, so that's, that's where the real, fear i think um comes from about performing and generally it's fine ableton itself is incredibly stable it, it, if there's a problem it would be with the interface or the power or something that it's it's happened and, and as long as you can get it going again if anything sometimes crowds get more more hyped up by the drama of the fact that it well they're like it's so, real yeah or it's certainly real, happening exactly. it's, it's a very real moment i mean it's a yeah. very very powerful moment uh for everyone involved in. <laughs> but it, I've even noticed the feeling like when I'm playing, this is, I've never even said this before, but like sometimes when things feel really in a flow and then your mind notices that and the audience is there. And then there's a, there's a voice that comes in. That's sort of like mm -hmm. the critical, like, well, what if the, what if the power mm -hmm. goes out or what if is the computer this? And I'm like, and I, it's the meditation or actually the moments from psychedelic spaces that allow me to sort of love that thought and just be like, it's okay. Back into it you know, back into it. It's just this constant sort of like clenching and releasing. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah. The tension of the moment. That's life clenching and releasing. <laughs> Sounds <laughs> unpleasant. Life. That, but that reminded me of something. Um, so when I was a teenager, I briefly, I was at the Royal College of Music uh, on the, just on the Saturdays, which they, you know, they had like a junior department and I had piano lessons with a really high level piano teacher called Emily Jeffrey, who was incredible and changed my life because she, got me into proper classical piano training and she got my finger technique up to an incredible level that I wouldn't have had a chance or, or been inspired to do and I, I found it really hard at first and wasn't that engaged but she managed to get me fully inspired and the results of that are that I can when I'm in practice I can access that again so I can be quite virtuosic and that was really useful on the polarity tour but briefly i thought okay maybe i'll be a classical pianist and that'll be my job this wow when really I, when, when i was a teenager yeah and then i had one concert which changed my mind forever um i won this competition at the royal college of music which meant and the prize of it was that you played a concerto with the orchestra to an audience in the in this grand concert hall that to me didn't really feel like a prize so much as a horrific an unbelievable <laughs> punishment but i've never felt pressure like that in my life and you know I, I it went really well um in terms of how it was received but my experience of it was was hellish and there was you know i played ravel's piano concerto in g which is incredibly technically complicated and utterly beautiful but there was a point which i'll never forget bear in mind there's no sheet music you've learned it all by this point you've been uh -huh. playing it for months there's just a point where i was just like looking down at my hands and and they were doing all this shit and i was like just uh -oh. for a second just for a second that very same voice yeah. you just talked about it came in and it said what are they doing what is happening here what are the yeah. thing what are your fingers doing it's like, and it's like but rather than have any you know being a 16 year old with no experience of you know what, what that voice is no understanding of how that voice can be bypassed or transcended um I just froze. I mean, I didn't freeze. Like somehow the fingers kept going, but I managed to freeze that part of my brain out of sheer necessity until I got to the end. But, you know, it was such an awful experience that I then and there essentially decided that I will never do that as a job. And um, it's like, you know, also it, it wasn't really creative enough to play other people's music, but yeah, that, that voice is terrifying. Was, it, was that an element of it though? The fact that it was someone else's music that made it harder or scarier, whereas because you kind of yeah. did continue with the job, but you changed the way you did it. Yeah. So if you're improvising and it's yours, there is no wrong anyway. And <laughs> because I play without thinking of, I play by ear and without thinking of scales or anything like that. So if, if some weird notes creep in, you can weave them in, you know, 
you know, as a principally originally I'm a piano player. So um, I feel increasingly comfortable just doing that. But it's as soon as you bring in all the other elements and, and that this and people and other humans as well, you know, things get much more complicated. Yeah, yeah. That's the thing with playing solo versus having other members. It definitely changes the dynamic of mm. what you play in the moment and so forth and what's planned and all that kind of stuff. But uh, yeah. yeah, so I wanted to ask you, um, this album is largely electronic elements i hear a lot of analog synthesizer i'm guessing mm -hmm. did a lot of that moog one in there yeah moog one um ms20 um called trinity a tiny bit maybe but most of it is there's this plugin called uh unicorder which nils from helped make which is a an amazing kind of it does a lot like his felt piano type sound thing yeah i've used very very convincingly yeah yeah. yeah, I don't use the sounds in a normal way, but um, because, you know, you can just play a, a piece that sounds like a Nils Fromm piece. <laughs> it's not as good, but you can just, you know, it allows you to step into that world very easily. And I'm not interested in doing that because he's doing that and lots of people are doing that. But, um, you know, he's a singular genius. I want to point that out. But Yeah, I, I'm I a wanna... huge Nils Fromm fan. Yeah. And mm -hmm. he came very close to doing a remix on the Ramdas album, to the oh, point wow. where we were sending stems and it was into it i was just like over the moon but yeah he disappeared <laughs> yeah <laughs> so, he's a busy man else we love you yeah. but uh, yeah yeah he's incredible but anyway so he made this plugin which allows anyone to play that felt piano sound basically yeah. which is incredible yeah it's great um but i didn't want to do i mean i've also got a piano with a felt thing on it so if i want to do that i will you know you can see it so, yeah and there's my there's the felt <laughs> right there yeah it's a beautiful sound and um but with this plugin, I found that it was a great source for other sounds with abstracting that. So it's like taking that as a source sound because I love to take um, real instruments and put them through the really any any processing that. I, that... See, but I need to interrupt you. My friend Justin Beretta, who is in the glitch. Yeah, mob, I've been in touch with him. Yeah, yeah. He describes you. He says John takes sounds and puts them through the Hopkins Destructo machine. <laughs> <laughs> and then they become whatever it is and no one can replicate it. And I was like, yes, the, the John Hopkins I mean, Destructo machine. All it is is just a <laughs> lot of processing. It just goes through chain after chain and, and you know, and I save the chains and then I'll, again, trusting in the synchronicity of it all and the desire of it all to become something, I might, I might put in a random chain of things on something that was supposed to be doing something completely different and then suddenly a new a new thing is born out of that but what what kind but, of things are you doing i mean a lot of like octaves pitching verbs there's there's well i mean ableton is so infinite i mean I, altiverb is probably one of the most creative tools um because i'm obsessed with dimensional space within music with stereo music and, and increasingly within the spatial audio which i'm getting into um so altiverb all the all the um sound toys stuff echo boy obviously is incredible mm -hmm. but these things are instruments in their own right that's how i view them so like you've got your sound that's great whatever it is say it's, say it's a, a normal piano and then you put all these effects on it and then you mute the dry and you just and then you maybe resample that in ableton and make a new instrument out of that which you play on your keyboard and then you put that through another chain until it's just really not in any way what it was but flowing freely down whatever whatever sort of calls to me whatever extra layer of processing calls to me um so i never use sends or returns every single sound has its entire completely unique um way of being processed so you would never use one reverb for several things for example um and I using the processor heavy too do you have to end up sort of bouncing into stems so you can keep going this this laptop that we're talking on now is actually what I've been using, and it's pretty seems to be pretty fast. I mean, the, yeah, there'll become a point where if you use a lot of tape simulation, like there's a sound um, on the album which uses I'm not joking about twenty five instances of a tape simulator in a row. Twenty five. Um, I think it was about twenty five, and it was a slate Hell of a laptop. Yeah. It was a slate plug. Well, no, that's the thing. It couldn't handle that. <laughs> so, <laughs> but what I found, there was this slate. It's called Slate Tape Emulator or something. I can't remember what it's called. But Yeah, I've got that. And you, yeah. yeah, and it's very processor heavy even to use one. But it's very, very subtle. And I think the idea is you put one on every track or something. And maybe, I don't know, I haven't read about it. But 
I'm interested in, I mean, the fact is on Ableton, you can just click on a plugin and Apple D and it duplicates it. So I thought, oh, okay, I put four on. Too easy. It's start, it's start, yeah, it's incredibly easy. All, all, this stuff is, all this stuff is just playing around. But um, the, the trick that the, the trick is to judge whether it's good or not. And that's what I think probably what takes years of doing it. But you can certainly get things done very, very quickly. Um, so I noticed that like with four instances of that, there was a little tape wobble that was becoming a bit more apparent. I was like, that's what I was looking for. So I selected all of those and then duplicated the four to eight and then eight to 16. And it started slowing down a lot, but it got more and more interesting. It was like, it started sounding incredible. And um, so I realized, okay, so I'll bounce everything else. And so nothing else is using any processing and I'll get this part right. And then I'll freeze this part and then, you know, bring that back into another session. So sometimes I'll work across multiple sessions in order to preserve um, that. But yeah, uh, most of them, yeah, with this laptop, which is uh, about a year old or a year and a half old, um, it can deal with it. And I've also just got a new actual desktop Mac, which I haven't yet wired in. So I think that will probably allow even more. You can now you can do like a hundred tape plugins in. Just keep going, man. Just see well, how far down, how yeah. far down the rabbit hole go. Yeah. <laughs> but it, you know, it's interesting to me to just try things that these things were not built to do that. And but right. then the realm of electronic music making is completely open and completely free. And you can, as long as it sounds good, it doesn't matter what you do or how well you understand what you're doing. I don't even try and understand what some of the plugins are actually doing to the sound. It doesn't interest me, but the sound of it interests me. And Obviously, mixing is a big part of this, and that's I'm more technical in mixing. But when it comes to creating sounds, just follow a train of thought. That's really ah, it's so inspiring. So, but when you were doing the music for psychedelic therapy, and you said it was largely from this intuitive space, but you're using electronic synths. Were you just doing that in real time? Like, like that opening track? It's fantastic, and you've got that bass mm -hmm. sub that's sort of sliding. Mm -hmm. Is that just you? Because there's different layers there going on, I assume. So yeah, you... so it's like building a, I think of it like building a little, building a room or building a universe or whatever, building yeah. a space that you're going to enter into. So there's obviously the first part that comes first. And for me, um, this is there's something very mysterious about the way that track existed or came to exist. Because for me, I always have to be sitting in this room before I have ideas. I don't start. The idea, a track doesn't occur to me when I'm walking around, but I'm aware that my brain is taking everything in. And like when I get into the studio, um, something will come out, you know, if I'm feeling creative. But just this one time I was um, I was walking around uh, the area where I live and it was like the middle of winter and there weren't there's no one really around because everyone was kind of in the houses and um, lockdown and all that stuff. And I was like out of nowhere this idea for those ascending notes at the start just appeared and like i knew what note they were going to start on and i knew that they would rise and rise and rise and there'd be one here and there'd be another one that comes up and so it's like that idea just appeared and that yeah honestly it's the first and only time that's ever happened to me and at the same time as i was walking um i was like in the middle of a text conversation with my friend who um lives in devon and records under the name seven rays and he's on several several of these tracks um he's got a, a kind of small holding farm and he's got a little solar powered studio it's not even that little it's actually pretty big it's like a kind of beautiful room with maybe 15 different synths and he's kind of collected a lot of strange old mm. synths and um i don't want to talk about the exact one it is because there's something mysterious about not mentioning it but he dove into this he, he just for some reason like not having made music for years you know primarily farming and re raising his family he just had become possessed by delving into this particular synth and um in fact i'll talk about what it is i don't know why i'm trying to be mysterious it was this synth called a fismo in, in sonic fismo which is from the mid 90s um it's so impenetrable it's got this tiny little screen like that <laughs> and um uh, you try and save your sounds you'll lose your sound you know you have to be recording in audio at all times and he and he it makes these extraordinary generative tones and he became obsessed with just creating loads and loads and loads of them and he'd sent me he was just sending me streams of them and neither of us knew why <laughs> we just knew that he was following something good we didn't know we were working together at this point he was just doing it and sharing it and then these notes were rising in my head and i got to the studio and i put 
there was one particular one it was test uh fismo test number 11 i remember it very clearly i just dragged it i dragged it into the track which was you know with these ascending notes and obviously it fit perfectly first time and and that's the basis of the track and then layer after layer of that the rest of it wrote itself based on how those elements sounded but the fact that he happened to be doing that at that exact time at which that idea appeared in my head is awesome. what, this this yeah. album was this album was full of things like that you know it would just so i wasn't even surprised by the end of it well sit around the fire is is like that too i would imagine too. yeah you know, it's like uh we had a very much synchronistic element of coming into being oh my dog <laughs> yeah yeah uh, it's just this this dog is with me part-time and um uh, she's she's like 12 going she's like a she's like a 75 year old uh grandma which is very like particular about what she likes right <laughs> but that the first track that i was curious though it definitely feels to me intentional for the role it plays in the album like as soon as that ding and then it's yeah. you're like whoa we're gonna go somewhere <laughs> together yeah. i mean so it seems like did you create it and then decide this should be first or do you thought to yourself it needs to start with sort of like a strong entrance well the to- creation of that one was so it's such a memorable moment because it i mean i spend a lot of time over music as, as we talked about but i write the basis of things very quickly and this one really took two and a half three days to form um structurally mm-hmm. and i you know for me finesse the sound and mixed mixing was very complex with that to make everything sit right but that just appeared with such clarity and with such speed um you know that's why it's called welcome it was just to me it was just, that could that could go nowhere else on the record the trouble was working out yeah. how to make it fit into other things that came later and it took um it's discovering that of course it goes into ecuador and it was like you know making that work energetically was was a fun challenge but um because if you could almost go from that into something energetic and maybe it will be the good start of a dj set or something if i'm it could go a lot of different directions from there exactly sure. yeah yeah but but friends of mine who've had psychedelic experiences in their life, um, particularly or strong ones, that when they hear that, when they heard that for the first time sober, they were just like they describe this kind of st- almost like a stomach lurching, like yep. What? Wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> where, yeah where are we going? Oh yeah. Uh, what have I done? Yeah. Yeah. And even if you you haven't done anything, and and people who haven't had that experience, I honestly do think that one that track may be slightly unclear as to what it's what it's about i know i played it to my mom and she was just like doesn't really she loves the album but she doesn't connect to that track and i don't know i think that one is coming very very clearly from um the dmt space for me that that's where, uh, that's where that's it's falling coming. off a cliff feeling yeah that's where yeah. it's coming from and and you know of course i'm not aware of that when i'm writing but listening to it um now I'm like yeah <laughs> it's, it's like whoa um and uh, you know a, a friend of mine sharif who actually helps helps me mix everything um he told me you know before he went in to mix this album um we do we kind of mix things in stages so i do a layer and he does a layer and then i come in and finish it off and he'll do extra little bits we've got a very kind of organic process that we do together but before mixing it he wanted to listen to the whole thing um as, as a mushroom journey to really add Mm. what he found to it and he was he was was like he took quite a high dose and then you know as he was starting to hit its peak he hit play and he'd he'd had various interesting visuals going on and he had a fun time with his cats and it was all kind of like you know we're tripping type stuff and then he said as soon as that came in like ridiculous amounts of rainbows just burst out of every surface and it was like what i haven't done anything like that to that track um i've only tried it with ketamine and it's it's certainly does the job but um i yeah god knows what will happen with with other medicines it's interesting well speaking of do you have time to talk a little bit about the ramdas track i want to be oh we we must i mean okay yeah Yeah. (laughs) so i um where do i start (laughs) there's so much to say i've had a few powerful experiences probably five or six and it makes it sound like i do a lot of uh, substances and I actually don't. I really don't. No, not do I. Actually, yeah, I think I've done. I've worked with mushrooms like maybe once in the past few years, and then. But I feel like I'm working with it every day. It's just, it just mm. forms my life. It's like some of the lessons I've learned, and and I find I'm talking about it all the time, but I don't even mm. buy with it that much. And that's interesting. 
but my partner is a ketamine. I do it more than that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but ketamine came into my life more recently yeah. because my partner's in this uh, totally legal above board therapy situation. So I was mm -hmm. going in to work on it. And um, I was working on a record that was from uh, these improvised mushroom ceremony spaces where I, I microdose, but uh, I thought it was a mushroom record and maybe it still is. And that's where it's from. But I, I found myself testing it in her ketamine with her patients mm -hmm. and with myself. And the same simultaneously, um, we, we were working on the sit around the fire and you were sending me some of those early mixes that you created. And so I was, I would play it in the set. We just drop it in and I, and it would just blow me away because amazing. it really felt like Ram Dass, like, it's amazing on, it's just listening to it. But when you're in that space, it's like, he is the space speaking to you like you're he's so perfectly and the music is so perfectly brings you into that space of like aha about what's really going on you know and, and there's I, I, the beauty how many times tears would come through me when i would think mm -hmm. in, about this imagery of like truly like all we're doing forever is is just essentially witnessing one another and sitting around a fire and that imagery of of just carrying each other through this experience for the sake of the experience it, it was so beautiful so i want to thank you for that but just tell you like i i would be nervous to tell you on text because i didn't want to be that guy's like oh my god i had this but i just try to be like look man it was i had a powerful experience <laughs> to say the least you know last night listening to this song and it's it just feels like profound medicine that's i think i told you once that it's going to save a life and what i meant like quite literally i know there'll be at least one if not thousands but there'll be one person i know it that's going to be on the brink of something they will hear that and it'll be enough hope for them to continue on the next day and that alone is so honorable you know yeah that's no incredible. what happens with that music yeah that's an incredible thought um i've had messages over the years of that severity from people um you know and it's that's when i feel luckiest that and most grateful really that that i have this purpose you know for, for like it's just it's it's like i would do this anyway even if no one listened <laughs> but it's amazing that they yeah. listen and it's amazing that some people are open to being helped in that way and um yeah i mean obviously the dream with this record is that it will do that on deeper levels than ever and um but i want to thank you for getting in touch originally and asking uh, and asking me to work on that and giving me the opportunity to have a ram dust talk to work over and also your beautiful vocals which were the musical trigger you know that's what where the, the compliment started from that and then putting him in there and feeling that you know that was sometimes making the tracks that have turned out well like i have this track called open eye signal which was like my breakthrough techno track it's like came out 2013 that was such a long and difficult process like i knew i was on something i knew the riff was great but like the technical side of bringing that into being was literally months you know mm -hmm. literally months to make it sound effortless was like it was weeks and weeks and weeks of the same riff going round and round and round this was the exact opposite this was it's not a hugely technically complex track it's all about feeling it's all feeling and it's all love and it's all his words guiding everything and having his words in my headphones and improvising the piano over it and letting the two letting the the instrument of his voice and your vocals and my piano play off each other and, and not having to move or edit anything it was like wherever your vocals landed that was where they're supposed to land wherever the piano landed that's crazy yeah all of that stuff you know i mean minor changes only sometimes just a bit more space here and there but it was like this is nothing and it was done it was done so quickly there's obviously some time into making sure the mix was right and making sure his voice sounded present and not too bright and the, but the yeah know, yeah we were talking about this other day like the just the, the the particular quality of the tape machine in the 70s that imbues this for me imbues this kind of immortality to the words because it, it was never new it was it feels like it was never new you know it certainly isn't new now it's coming from a different time to an, an, a, as a, a group of people at, who are listening to that talk and we don't know who any of them are many of them are will be alive and maybe some of them will hear this and they'll remember it i don't know but it's it's it feels like this extraordinary opportunity to, through modern technology, get those words out there again yeah. to a new generation as well. Absolutely. Let me shut this door.
Yeah, it's a talk from 1975. So mm -hmm. it's a long time ago, but he's saying stuff that's so universal. And you're right. It's not necessarily new what he's saying. It's how he's saying it. And it's the feeling that's conveyed. He's in a very special place. It's not intellectual. It's all just beautiful, open. It's just all heart. Mm. And, and so I think that's what's coming through um, on the music that you're playing and hopefully in the vocals that are there. Because you had asked me to start something, and I'll be honest with you, that was something I, I tried not to think about too hard because it's like, you know. I've been a fan of you for a long time, man. So it's like, when you're like, Hey, send me a song. I, the last thing I want to do is like, Oh my God, I could spend a year on this, but I'd like just to send something, just make it a first draft and don't worry about it too much. Knowing that you'll mess. I knew the destructo machine as like, and then let you just destruct <laughs> it and do whatever, let it be a, yeah. just a, a match to a fire. So it was just really wonderful that that could then, because I remember when you went in the studio, you said it's kind of like one big session. You're like, I just had this amazing experience where it just all mm -hmm. came out. Mm -hmm. um, and that's always a great sign or it's a great feeling. I know that feeling. It's amazing. Yeah. I, I think it, it was great that you were open to doing that because I love, I mean, in collaborations, I always ask for a starting point. It doesn't really matter how finished it is, as long as the person I'm working with is happy for it to be destroyed. It's yeah, exactly, exactly. But, like the, but the point is the seed was there, like beautifully there, like the vocals were it. And it was, it was just a case, like I just putting them, I think I did, I remember like having the session up and soloing them. And before I even listened to them on their own, just put them into one of these chains that I have ready, uh, ready. And it's like, so there's altiverbs definitely in there. There's a few other reverbs, um, but it just, straight away like, yeah that's it <laughs> <laughs> and at that time you didn't have this this record wasn't really a record you didn't know it might just be a, a single i think we were thinking we just put it out potentially as a way to celebrate yeah. just more wrong yeah. that's it and um i think the idea came a bit later um that it would that it would close this record i mean i had written the tyos caves piece at this point right um which i've talked about in, in online and stuff but that you know that's been available for a while on through a paywall on the website tayos.org t-a-y-o-s.org if anyone wants to go and listen in advance of the album release um that was in that was 20 minutes of stuff that was written and that was born in rainforest in 2018 and so that was the true seed of this album but again i didn't see that as something that would necessarily be on an album either and then mm. and then it was really from yeah sit around the fire appeared and then I think it was really from January where I just went through a lot of stuff in my life and then just channeled. And this is when I sort of turned into this bizarre beer drinking shamanic channel <laughs> <laughs> where uh, it's like four months of, you know, trance state music just started appearing from. And then it was like, okay, welcome is the beginning. Tyos is the middle, sit around the fire is the end. Everything in between has just appeared. And, you know, that's kind of it really. Because your singing bowl piece was before this. And I'm curious, like coming yeah. from like someone who makes such like intense, beautiful techno music like that, that end of the spectrum. And then in the same artist releases the singing bowl piece. I mean, you're speaking my language because I'm all over the, mm. myself. It's like I do all sorts of things. But it's like, mm. is there a part of you that was like holding back or nervous about taking that shift? This is your career, too, and your job. Or were you just like, no, this feels very clear to me that uh, it doesn't matter like what niche it's going to fill, how I yeah. perform it, what the fans think. I just, this is what I need to do. Yeah. I, I, I've never been so certain about anything. And I'm realizing that as I talk about, as I start to finally talk about this, having kept it to myself for ages, I mean, of course there's all the practicalities. Um, but I think that the, yeah, the practicalities of, of, of like changing the direction of what you're doing, but I have always made, solo piano pieces yeah, really i don't think it's it. a departure uh, yeah, there's, yeah there are ambient pieces out there but it's true that the focus tracks in the last 10 years have all been big rhythmic entities and um but you can't keep doing the same thing forever and, and i really was done with that and i will go back to doing i definitely not done with rhythm i'm fascinated still how to bring in um maybe this more digital shamanic element into um back into a more more danceable area because i think that could be really powerful for people on the dance floor but but really yeah i think i've never felt more sure about anything to the point where if it's you know i, I don't expect amazing reviews i think you kind of have to listen to this quite a lot of times in a certain way to to hear it properly 
I'm not really expecting anything at all. I just need it. Just needs to exist, and it does. And people can do. Hopefully, well, the, review, hopefully the reviews you're going to get essentially are the people who do this for the journeys, and because of the title, this happened for me when I did music for mushrooms. Like it, mm. it helps people. It's an invitation. Yeah. Like if you'd called this something else, it actually would have done a disservice to what it really is. Because yeah. of the title, it, it will be used by people in ketamine therapy clinic it will dream, be used yeah. by individuals all over the world for gen for a long time and because of that they will then enter into some incredibly profound states that the music will help usher them into and sort of guide them into these spaces and that alone um, is doing such a service to the movement of <laughs> humanity trying not to kill themselves <laughs> you know just yeah help people uh i gotta commend you for that because knowing from my own experience that takes a lot of bravery to say you could have called this album anything and yeah but I, yeah i know what you mean it's just but that's when it comes back to that point really about now is not the time well that's 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 what i'm commending yeah. is like yeah, i yeah, totally yeah. agree with you is like a lot of people would be like I'm, I'm sure there's record labels or pr people i i i was i've been working on a book and this is a side note but i mm. sent it to an agent and the, this agent didn't get it and the first thing they said to me is like i think this would work if we took the drug stuff out and uh, I was like, oh, the drug stuff. Yeah, okay. I was like, some people, there's still people out there generationally mostly who think sure, like, totally. oh, you're making a big mistake or don't, you don't yeah. want to talk about that. Or it's like, and I think that that it's, the tables have turned so much in the last year that it's sort of now it's a move. Yeah, point. but even uh, the last year, but it's interesting because my Singularity album, um, I did go out and talk about much. I mean, it has a, it has a, can't remember now if it's a psilocybin or a dmt molecule in the stars on the front cover and I, I mean that's reasonably hidden but not that hidden if you know what you're looking for and i did talk in the press quite a lot about how the track luminous beings came from a psilocybin experience in the desert and i, I met no resistance really because i think you know i'm an indie artist not, musician not, too yeah yeah musician i'm not not mainstream never gonna have it's not like i'm you know, I don't, I'm not going to pick a band, but just some some huge act. It's just it would be very, very much more dangerous for that. But people that are paying attention to what I'm doing are, are generally seem to be inclined that way, anyway, or at least open to having. You know, what we all want to do here is have an adult conversation about some medicines that exist. That's really sure. You know, and we need musical frameworks for these. So that's really what's most important. You know, and it, I'd, I'd be surprised if anyone who hears, is this going to be you know it's in my head it's like it's the most experimental thing i've done it, who knows of course where the round dust track could could potentially reach a lot of people because the words you know, alone make it very accessible yeah. and you know there's ideas there and it has it's i mean it's beautiful you did beautiful work there um just just a couple more questions and then i'll, I'll let you get on with your your beer drinking evening there um and your day Not drinking this evening actually <laughs> oh i'm sure i'll have a beer yeah good um, <laughs> um your voice there's a moment in mm. the record where way in the background there's someone humming and mm. it was it the couple times i've journeyed to the record that is my favorite moment for some reason mm. something about it feels uh like i'm a, i don't even know how to describe it it's about it's childlike it's it, it just takes me somewhere and it's the way there's so many elements in this record that are like you kind of have to reach for them with your ear like they're in their back there. It's not just given to me. And I'm like, so I have to kind of investigate with curiosity. What is that? You know, is, and then I asked you, I said, is that you singing? And you said, yes. And I was like, well, you have a nice voice. Like, why is, is this sort of um, hidden in general? Do you sing often or how, when does this come into your music? And tell me about that moment and what that serves. It's the only time I hear it in there. Yeah, so I mean, it's interesting. I have been singing on my stuff for a long time, but I tend to do it like to mention that track, "Open My Signal." There's this kind of choralish sound in there. That's my voice layered up many times, and then there's a lot Beautiful. of process. Yeah, there's a lot of processing on it in that. What I don't do is leave it unprocessed in this way. So this has just got a little bit of reverb placement, but otherwise it's untouched. Um, <clears throat> so the way it happened was again all about trusting that there's a purpose in, in this and that this is this wants to exist in a certain way i was finishing this end or just working on the end section of the track where that appears and um 
I mean, I've divided them into separate chapters now, but really it's, you know, somewhere in the second half, you could, you could say yeah. it is. Um, and it's been quite cosmic for quite a while. There's been like a 10 minute section of really quite crazy harmonics and very electronic based sounds, which, you know, when you're within the medicine, you kind of, for me, that's very like galactic and very cosmic and very and highly highly not to do with earth in particular you know it's very out there and as it came to an end that section i was like I, my, what i'm craving here is something earthbound something completely grounded and my normal go-to is to you know is, is, is the piano <laughs> to go over there and just sure. simple simple piano chords at this point would be nice but i was like wait but i always do that and sit around the fires coming on in like another 10 minutes or something i realized <laughs> just because otherwise it's going to be a 90 minute album. So, um, and I caught myself humming and I hum all the time. Anyone who's ever like taken anything with me or just hung out with me for, for a period of time, certainly anyone who's ever done DMT with me knows that I hum with the music. And I feel like it's a, it's a bridge between, yeah, it is a bridge between yourself and your deepest part of yourself and the vibrations that you're taking in. It feels really music, good too. Yeah, it feels really good. And, yeah. the, and the medicine as well. It makes you feel great on the medicine. And um, so I, f I found myself humming. And then I was just like, right, I'm going to get that microphone, the same one I used to capture the uh, the beer glass, and just just hummed, hummed it out. And there was this really strange noise on the channel. Having said it was unprocessed, it wasn't unprocessed. I did do some filtering. And because there was this crazy, you know, sometimes you plug your mic in and it makes all these weird crackly noises. And I don't, I, you know, my engineer Sharif deals with all the mics. So I don't know anything about why they might go wrong, but on this occasion, this mic was just crackling like a fire, and it was kind of cool, but kind of disruptive. <laughs> so I hummed this melody, and then, in order to get rid of the, you know, the, the the bits of that crackle they didn't like, I had to make quite a tight filter around it, which had the effect of just making it really, really pure, almost sine wavy, but keeping all the inflections. You know, there's this. It, to me, it sounds slightly celtic and slightly yeah, i don't know yeah, almost yeah. like a strange little ceremonial you know a kind of celtic icaro or something but it just appeared and um it got treated that way because it had to be treated that way and then i just put it you know i placed it with the reverb and it was just like yeah that's i guess that's there then <laughs> you know it, it felt very kind of egoless and very about it's like if you're trying to be honest and that was about as honest as as i could be because any friend like i guess any friend i've taken dmt with or anything you know it just took it's taken them straight back to that experience because this part of me just will do that so yeah you know it's it's putting everything of my self into it well it just sounds like i hear over and over again these series of gifts that were coming through like a little melody or um, mm -hmm. a little mistake but you're accepting it as a gift maybe it's an idea and it just it all just starts you just take you're receiving of all the little things that came in yeah. and allowing them to just be inputted in like oh we'll figure it out later but it ends up yeah we being the piece yeah that's it yeah and it's um that's such a joyful way to write and it's nice to write something where you don't feel like you fought with it at any point um you know uh, and it was so yeah i'll never forget the experience whatever happens to it it's important to remember before anyone hears it that that the experience itself was life-changingly beautiful so mm. um yeah well, it's it's been the same for me getting to know you and, and working even a, in a tiny way on this record mm. with you. I'm honored and I'm just so overjoyed that it's getting out into the world. And we all thank you for uh, stepping forward with such grace and authority to say, this is what I'm going to do. And I'm doing it. Oh. I've done it. Thanks, man. I really appreciate that. And yeah, once again, thank you for um, inviting me to work on that beautiful speech with you and uh yeah look forward to meeting in person yes of, of course and thank you to uh ram das and love server member foundation and everybody else to anna for introducing us and to domino for working on this and everybody else it's been mm -hmm. really great um is there anything else you'd like to say to let people know before they were is there any like hey if you're going to listen to this record this is my message to you or is it just totally like it's your call to your thing i think i think generally um I think we've pretty much covered it all apart from, you know, I think do at some point, whether you use medicines or not, um, listen to the whole thing lying down in the dark. Give it the space. Give yeah, it the carve space. Carve out the I, space I, a bit. Turn off the phone. You know, it's like yeah, give yourself the that, hour to experience yeah. it. Yeah. 
that's it whether it's headphones or speakers really whatever you feel most comfortable and there's something about headphones which does work well but then i yeah sometimes blasting it on speakers is you know and let it take you over and then just see what happens <laughs> i love it john hopkins thank you very much man it's a pleasure thank you so much <laughs>